Hey guys, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. A big thank you to all the new subscribers and the old ones too. You never can tell from show to show what we're going to cover here on this program and on this channel. And we're going to do a McCartney show right now. It just so happens that one of my guests just messaged me. I hadn't spoken to him in quite a while. And that's Sam Wiles, who hosts his own Paul McCartney podcast called Paul or Nothing. And he's with us. Hello, Sam. Hey, Ken. Great to be back as always. It has actually been far too long. And I'm looking forward to doing one of my favorite things ever, which is forcing my McCartney opinions on your audience. So I'm looking forward to it. And we're all enjoying it. <laughs> Excellent. And I never quite know from show to show what you're going to look like, whether your hair is very long or whether it was really short, like uh, the Youngblood show that you did. <laughs> Ken. I'm do a haircut. It's kind of, I think I look too much like Andrew WK or like a 70s hair metal guy. It's got to go now. It's got to okay. Go. All right. I, I, I prefer you with the long hair. So I would say keep it. But anyway, the woman like... who uh, the woman who owns the house I live in doesn't like the hair, though. So unfortunately, everyone, even at the age of 30, you still got to do what mom says. I'm afraid. <laughs> well, you know, the Beatles always change their appearances. So you got to be like them. Tie back a bit. <laughs> and we also have with us Luca Parasi, who's been on the channel a couple of times recently. Luke is the author of this fine book, which I'm still reading. <laughs> Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas, and uh, subtitled The Stories Behind the Songs, Volume 1, 1970 through 1989. We just had him on to cover the 70s. We'll have him on back again to cover the 80s. Luca, good to have you back. I can thanks uh, thanks for this um, invitation to another episode. Uh, good to see Sam as well. So yeah, let's uh, let's enjoy this uh, this uh, this hour together. All right. About uh, half a year ago, I invited three of my friends on. Who um, we all talked about what we felt were Paul McCartney's top three most underrated studio albums. I thought, why not do it again and have uh, two guys on who do work on Paul <laughs> all the time. And uh, to be specific, I did say these have to be studio albums, so no live albums, um, no compilations, no greatest hits. If you want it to be a Wings album, and some people do make a distinction between Wings and Solo Paul, that's fine. You can include Wings, you can include The Fireman. Uh, if you want to, you could even include classical music, any of Paul's classical works. So each of you guys are going to list for all of our viewers what are your top three in order, in order of rank, three, two, one. And uh, we'll just share our opinions about what you have to say about this. I love hearing different opinions from different Beatle experts. And so why don't we start with Luca? With your number three choice. Okay, number three for me is uh, Press to Play. <laughs> I would go for this uh, for this album. Uh, well, we can say it's it's underrated, or at least it's not considered as one of his best. And um, I admit, uh, I went through different phases uh, with this uh, album. Uh, well, it, it went out when I was 16. Mm -hmm. So apart from Pipes of Peace, that was my first introduction to Paul. But Press of Play was the first album I really bought conscious because I, in the meantime, I was uh, I became a, a big fan. So it didn't it didn't sell well at the time. It was well critically well something in the middle. Uh, so it was quite hard for me to accept the, the fact at the time that Paul was not charting high, mm. which for me was uh, was interesting. I, I mean, uh, I was always interested in in, uh, in his chart uh, placements all over the years, and so yeah, I mean, as as a young boy, it was uh, was kind of um, disappointing, and then uh, all over the years and the decades. Uh, <clears throat> Other people uh, um, talk about uh, Press to Play as being the uh, experimental uh, mm -hmm. album or, you know, uh, 
with, with a lot of um, mm, you know attention to the eighties uh, sound, which is true, mm-hmm. and also it's true that is an experimental album in some spots. I mean, a couple of tracks are really heavily experimental. Uh, definitely, is not a typical um, McCartney album, uh, except for. You know the well, maybe the two ballads, uh, "Footprints" and uh, "Only Love Remains," uh, are typical uh, press. It's uh, modern sounding, but it's essentially a pop song. Mm-hmm. But you know, in 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 the end, uh, I think uh, it deserves uh, more. Uh, there's something to consider, in my opinion, that uh, at the time I have bought uh, the LP version which has got 10 songs, but at the same time, uh, CD uh, went out as well. I, I, it was not my, it was not the choice for me. At the time for me, LP was, was a standard. Mm-hmm. So, but the CD has got three more tracks that are very good in my opinion. So that's, uh, that's my, my number three. Uh, okay. Then if you want to ask me something more, uh, I'm available to, yeah, before you continue, um, I should specify here, because Luca was asking me before we started recording, what do you mean exactly by underrated? Because there are albums that commercially did extremely well, especially with Paul in the 70s and in part, you know, in the 80s. Um, but I'm thinking more the public and the fans today and how they view these albums and everything changes over time. Like I've said a million times about Ram, how Ram is now respected. Whereas when it first came out, it was lambasted by the critics and all. But um, you never quite know from year to year, from decade to decade, how the public's going to feel about certain albums. And you could certainly look back to the 70s and see, at least in the United States, there are albums like Wings at the Speed of Sound, which was number one for seven weeks. I don't think that album is respected as much as other albums in McCartney's canon. So we're really looking at how we feel these albums are viewed today, regardless of how well it sold initially. But um, how did, because I'm so used to thinking, you know, I'm an American. I know the American market. I know how well things did here. How was Press to Play viewed where you live in Italy? Was it really considered the same way? Well, I mean, uh, I, if I'm not wrong, uh, for for what it counts, it was uh, number eight uh, as well in the Italy charts at the time. Mm. And McCartney got a good uh, media exposure. For some reason, he was interviewed by by a famous Italian uh, journalist at the time. So he was uh, on, on a couple of, uh, of magazines uh, on the front cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it faded quite early i mean at the time I, I remember i was thinking why press uh, wasn't not as uh, successful as a single as um mm. i don't know there was a there was a kind of a pop song by rod stewart at the time i can't remember the the name at the moment but mm-hmm. it was in the charts in the same period and to my ears uh the quality of the two songs was comparable and the Rod Stewart song was more successful, at least in Italy. Uh, you know, uh, radio, uh, airing and stuff. Uh, mm. And press was a little bit less successful. So, but it was regarded uh, something in the middle. I, I mean, um, I remember there was a review on um, on an Italian magazine at the time that uh, was a weekly magazine. It was not really that clear. Uh, which was the assessment, the final assessment. Mm. Like it was treated like, uh, you know, okay, it's a McCartney album. So we 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 just try to do uh, an average kind of uh, review. It was not that clear if, if the album was good or, or, or not or something in the middle. To me, it was very generic. <laughs> that, uh-huh. that was it. But it reminds me, you know, uh, 90... 86 me being uh, 17 so good good uh, good memories <laughs> okay um was there any view of 
McCartney's trying to, you know, go with the trends of the time and maybe they, they frowned on that or was, was it viewed more favorably that, you know, he was being more adaptable. No, you, nothing, you... nothing uh, specific on, on that uh, aspect. Yeah. I remember uh, what that my feeling was, uh, uh, I was expecting from the cover a completely different album. Mm. More more melodic, maybe more uh, retro sounding, and then is is the opposite, which is kind of uh, fascinating. Maybe it was done on purpose. I don't know. So we got this spectacular cover, in my opinion, <laughs> uh -huh. and then you got a, a, a modern uh, sounding. Uh, yeah, exactly, a modern sounding uh, uh, album, but with 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 a front cover that that is is a. Uh, uh, a throwback to to the forties or something like that. So right. So it's it's the original thing to do. <laughs> it actually reminded me of double McCartney fantasy. <laughs> the double fantasy album cover of just yeah. John and Yoko and in you know black and white close up like that. Um yeah. And I also think that those three bonus tracks on the C D make make a big difference. I mean tough on a tightrope. Yeah. Uh, to me is one of my favorites um and how did you feel about the collaboration between paul and eric stewart well uh paul himself uh was a little bit uh, disappointed or he said it didn't work um, i don't know i mean um it depends on also from the production side it uh well the songs are are good there are there are good songs they 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 have co-written together on the production side sometimes uh it's a little bit um well maybe penalize a bit the, the songwriting so i don't know also yeah. also eric uh put out a book in 2017 and uh talk about uh, the the sessions and uh and stuff so there were some aspects that they didn't work. It, it seems difficult to to separate the uh, songwriting stuff from the production side because he was involved in that uh, as well, or, or at least uh, he was thinking about uh, uh, being involved and then uh, they changed uh, the plan and stuff. I think that Footprints, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very nice uh, song and uh, Another one which is uh, co-written that I like very much is uh, Tough on a Tiger. Mm. Very much so. Yeah. Um, Sam, you want to chime in? Your thoughts about Press to Play? I bet, you know, he was laughing as soon as you said Press to Play because he knows that I'm a champion of that album. He's probably thinking, this is why you have Luca on. <laughs> well, not only that, Ken, but I realized about... 20 minutes into my first chat with Luca over half a decade ago that we have very similar song tastes. I remember uh, oh. reading Luca's first book. He loves Monkberry and Moon Delight. I was like, yep, yeah, me and Luca are quite similar. Uh, my first album is going to continue that trend. I think having me and Luca on this same episode could be quite interesting, uh -huh. especially with his next two choices, because my first one is also pressed to play. That's why I had it at hand. And... A lot of what I consider to be underrated albums are largely based on what the fan base told me about going in, because Paul and I think mm. is a chronological show. I've not listened to all the albums, so each time I listen to it, for the, it's for the first time. And, you know, some people warned me about issues with wildlife or speed of sound uh, or, or um, like Red Rose Speedway. People you know, they said the occasional less than stellar thing about it, but Press to Play was the first one when people went, no, no, Sam, this is when it gets bad. This is this is when things take a downturn. And yeah, commercially, that is certainly the case, even though the uh, commercial side of Paul seemed to fall off, I'd say, after City Love Songs, when every second single from that point onwards had a huge drop after the first very successful single. But, well, that could also be the choice of single. Yeah, oh, 100. You know, oh, no. um, I mean... We all know uh, Paul's I'm... the worst of his material. <laughs> With London Town, you know, with a little luck as a number one hit here, and then I've had enough, which I like a lot, but would never have chosen that as a second single. But that's that's also me. But then uh, I expected but... uh, when I had Luca on before. I, I, oh no, this was with Michael Ventrella. Um, letting go. 
I mean, how could that not be a huge hit? <laughs> And uh, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, Venus and Mars was actually one of my original choices because that album is underrated compared to Band on the Run. And I I think Venus and Mars should be held as the real zenith of the mid-wings period. Huh. But um, back to Press to Play. Ken, we've talked about McCartney's 80s period in a whole episode before. And we're going to kind of touch on that again here. But I know you... Your issue with a lot of the talk around this album is that people say it's too dated, and that's a phrase I know you don't like. You don't even really agree with the term. Yeah. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because I think it does sound very 80s, but in a positive way. I think that's the actual album's greatest strength. I think the the year in which a McCartney album is recorded is one of the top 10 most interesting things about any one of these albums. Hey, do you want to hear what Paul with this very defined sound that runs through, you know, I'd say half of his songs are on this very straight and narrow edge that goes through every album. But hey, what if half of the songs on this album sound really 80s and different and have different production techniques and mm-hmm. a different sound and style? That to me is more interesting than, do you want to listen to an album of middle of the road, surefire easy hits like a flaming pie or a flowers in the dirt mm-hmm. i find even though those are better albums i think they're less interesting than something like press to play you've got incredible production on it i know the producer and paul had fallings out and stuff but hey a little bit of tension never hurt anyone just look at flowers in the dirt again um with press to play i think all of its perceived negatives are actually positives that people are just framing incorrectly in in the discussion like why is it bad if it sounds 80s i mean when i listen to hall and oats i don't go there hoping that it sounds like a 70s or 90s record i go in Mm -hmm. there hoping to hear you know classic 80s stuff when i listen to true blue by madonna i don't want it to sound like ray of light you know you want it to sound like it's going to sound then it's really simple um, the only other issue that may hold press to play back is that the sides are the wrong way round, like quite clearly. I mean, what do you mean? So, so, why do we end the album with however absurd the lesser ballad? It's 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 far less substantial than Only Love Remains. If we swap the sides round, you end it with Only Love Remains, and you start the album with the title track. And it's honestly, Ken, I listened to it today in preparation for this. I listened to it two and one. Do it after after this, completely recontextualizes it, flows way better. Um, okay. I just think however absurd, absurd, however absurd, which Paul said is very beatly. And who has who has the right? I think so. Definitely melodically, the piano chords, the orchestration. It's definitely very beatly to me. Maybe it sounds, you know, it has a very majestic sound to close mm. the album. I think, um, I don't know. I love, I love uh, the order of the songs on Press to Play. But, you know, it's a funny thing about that album. Um, it's almost like, you know, there are fans out there like us that support it. But the three primary participants don't. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've got, you've got Eric Stewart saying that he liked the songs, but he didn't like the production. You got Hugh Padgham saying that he liked the production, but he thought that the the song material was weak. very good. <laughs> and Paul just looks at the sales and sees that it doesn't chart well and thinks that it wasn't successful. Therefore, you know, it wasn't a successful partnership with Eric Stewart or Hugh Padgham. So, but I mean, I'm actually quite surprised that Paul chose uh, to have the Chaos and Creation album cover to be black and white because his last two black and white album covers did not do well with either him or the fan base. So maybe that was him trying to break the curse. I don't know. No, but um, no, I love, I love press to play as, as you know, Sam. And for, uh, to me, uh, most McCartney albums have, it's a balance of traditional Paul with experimental Paul and the experimental, like talk more talk and certainly pretty little head, which I've always said is very Peter Gabriel ish. Um, <laughs> You know, it's like, when did you ever hear him do a song like that before? And I love it for that reason. It's so refreshing Mm -hmm. when you hear that, you know, and at the same time. That's all of Paul's 80s, though. All of Paul's 80s records, except for McCartney 2, because that's obviously experimental. Yes. But every one of Paul's 80s records, 
there's one or two tracks on it where, where you're like, hang on, this isn't in the theme at all. This is just Paul going, you know, if um if I don't put the song on the record, it's just, it's just going to be stuck in my head for the next ten years. <laughs> so, uh, like you know, I love you know th- throwing on something like Hey Hey onto Pipes of Peace or something. Yeah, it's nothing to do with the rest of the album, but without it, the House of Cards crumbles. Man, just does. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey. I use I <laughs> use that song. That's my theme for my radio show. Hey, hey. Oh, I didn't know as well. Um, it's co-written. Uh, it's actually co-written by uh, Clark. Stanley well. Clark. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Which but, is a fun uh, little uh, bit, 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 bit of trivia for him around the uh, Christmas dinner table, you know. That's um, I love all the stuff you said there, Sam. Very, very well said you about always do, play. Ken, you always do. Yes. <laughs> well, you have you have a very different point of view from a lot of people, and that's good. I want to hear different opinions. So for the two of you, let's start with Luca again. What's your number two choice? I'm excited. Number two is uh, is another black and white uh, cover. <laughs> I know what it is. <laughs> it's driving rain. Oh, oh god! Okay, rain. folks, can okay. I can I just interrupt? I'm going to take my camera up. Can everyone just see what? Oh no, it won't show it. Oh, I tried to show you what the second one on my list was, just to prove that I'm not making this up. Oh, well, you're, you're in agreement. You're both going to have the same top three, huh? Oh, God. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Oh, God. We, we didn't it. speak before. We didn't speak before. Anyway, <laughs> well, that, that's a good thing of, uh, of doing this uh, these shows. So this uh, may be surprises. And, um, yeah, Driving Rain. Uh, that was another difficult um, one because, uh, well, I think it was the worst chart placement when it comes to uh studio album mm-hmm. and uh well uh if you at the time the cd had replaced basically the lp as a the main format mm-hmm. so to my surprise i have discovered many years later that is a double up a double lp <laughs> which I bought immediately and uh, which is interesting because uh, I think it would have been the first double uh, studio LP or McCarthy's name or something like that if the LP would have been the, the main format it wasn't perceived like that obviously right. uh, it's a very long uh, album uh, even though we 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 take out uh, freedom, uh, it's a very long album, over one hour of music, right? And that's why it's a double album. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, uh, also here, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, things that are not uh, uh, typical or expected from Paul. We we cannot we cannot say, uh, oh, Paul is playing safe. He's not. Mm-hmm. He's not. Is a is a band album which uh makes it uh, very enjoyable to to my ears i have re-listened to to the album quite recently and i must admit i have enjoyed it very much way way more than uh when it uh went out uh also in, in this case i was very disappointed to to see the album not charting well and not uh, performing well commercially uh but there's a lot of things going on i mean uh you have rock tracks you have ballads i i must admit my favorite track on on, on the album is heather hmm. it's a beautiful oh, it's, a beautiful it's, 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 it's uh, not uh, up to date <laughs> but uh, the song is uh is incredibly good I mean, it's uh, it's a fantastic track that that uh, lifts lifts up my spirit. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of things going in this album. Yeah, I feel kind of the same way. I always I always like to point out the real oddball songs that Paul does every now and then, and I also see a similarity between Driving Rain and Press to Play. Mm-hmm. Just when I think about something like She's Given Up Talking, reminds me of talk more talk (laughs) you know third song side one you know um 
I love spinning on an axis. I mean, that's such a weird song. And Paul is playing with his vocals all over the place. You know, it has it has a spontaneous feel, this album. And yet it's also a very tight album. You know, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I see what you're saying there. But um, it's kind of funny. Every now and then I'll go on YouTube and so many people have their list ranking all the McCartney albums. And uh, so many <laughs> people you'll find, you'll find press to play, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> press to play and driving rain at the bottom. And those are people that tend to like the more traditional seventies, Paul, the flaming pies, the chaos and creation albums. And for those that don't like when Paul tries to sound modern and contemporary, then they don't really care for press to play in driving rain but well it, it's um it's an album that sounds differently and that's uh that's one of the things i like uh about uh, mccartney's um uh, studio output you basically don't have two albums sounding the same and it's not easy it's not easy and he, i think he was uh it was uh it was a brave uh, move for him to just uh bring in uh Three guys that uh, he didn't know at the time, never mm -hmm. played with, uh, with them together, and just go in the studio and basically doing the the album in over three weeks in Los Angeles in February March, uh, and then adding just a, other two weeks in June, and that was it. So right. a quick album compared to to two others. Well, I mean. Uh, uh, the production style is very original. Uh, few instruments, a lot of guitars sounding very different uh, from track to track. So I like it. Okay. How do you feel about something uh, as long as Rinse the Raindrops going on for over 10 minutes? Well, <laughs> I mean, no, no, I like it. I mean, uh, it was it was something uh, that I, I at the time I, I said uh, and I thought, uh, well, there was about time to 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 throw in something like that, just like a jam, like a, like something he does on on sound checks and hmm. stuff. So that was uh, another another original uh, thing. I like I like the track. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a compilation of bits basically because it that was. Uh, over 30 minutes originally so it was a uh, it's a compilation but it it works it works very well okay sam is your number two also going to be driving rain <laughs> my second choice ken i'm going to be going with paul's 2001 release <laughs> driving rain uh yeah this is easily the most it's not my number one because my own number ones i've got personal reasons on top of it uh -huh. but objectively if we get the stats in if we get the nsa to monitor everyone's internet search results you will see that driving rain is the most unfairly uncharitably reviewed mccartney album there's ever been like not only do people go in with the wrong mindset they like seem to come out with the wrong mindset and i, and I feel like it's an album that is bogged down by being the follow-up to flaming pie being the post Linda Death album, being the mm. post 9 11 album, the Heather Mills era, the first Macca album of the millennium, the, the the decline of record sales in general, the decline of adult contemporary in general. It is a whirlpool of, oh, fuck, I've got to read. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. Oh, darn. I've got to. <laughs> I've got to redesign my entire image and sound here. And thankfully he didn't. Uh, he didn't do a complete revamp. Like he's never actually done that, you know, like, oh, oh, I'm going to revamp my sound after press to press to press to play. He comes out with Flowers of the Dirt. It's not the biggest change ever. But he he talks about this as if he was like, well, you know, I was like a punk band when I did Rolling Road, but then I became a Euro dance pop after. It's like, no, this is still very clearly a Paul McCartney album, but it's unique. It's unique like having uh, Mendelssohn's production on Off the Ground or Padham's production on Press mm. Play. You get David Kahn here. And oh my God, 
might be the most underrated McCartney producer ever. He's the only guy who's ever made Paul actually sound heavy and loud and hardcore without any irony or uh, trying too hard. Like, you know, I've had enough wishes it had the guitar tones of Driving Rain. This is a hard rock album with hard rocking guitarists trying to impress Paul as well. I think there's a certain lack of comfort on this album that really lends to that spontaneity. Uh I mean, where else can you get a McCartney album where he is so, maybe except for Ram, where he's this emotional, he's actually putting himself out there. I'm sad and I'm upset. Linda's gone, oh, I'm also falling in love. Like the right. two biggest McCartney emotions ever on one album. Yeah, it's a mess and it's tonally all over the place. But so are some of my best friends. You know, it's it's just one of those <laughs> albums that once, once you love it, you're never going to have it. Like I can take the mick out of Driving Rain. I don't want anyone else taking the mick out of driving rain. It is so <laughs> good. Like, um, like so many of the top songs in his discography are here. Um, you've got the title track, horrendously underrated. Magic, a wonderful little ballad. Freedom, mm. uh, a great single. I don't care what the critics said about that one. It is one of the best McCartney hooks and choruses ever. Um, oh, I can't think of the one. I'm trying to think of a uh, man looks up something on computer. I'm glad you said what you said about freedom, but okay. Uh, your way. Oh, yeah. Your way is, I mean, we all know that quote. Yeah, I never really got around to finishing Bitbop. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a very good song, is it? Yeah. Your way is what if he finished Bitbop and actually put production into it? Oh, it's one of the best songs of his career. It just make oh and Ken, you're right. Spinning on an axis, great tune. Uh, riding into Jaipur. Uh, shout out to my man Dylan CV. Possibly in the top twenty five McCartney songs ever. Top five McCartney B sides ever. Why do you feel that I, way about riding into Jaipur? I mean, I like it a lot, and I love all the different sounds and the Indian well, sounds. Yeah, it's and- it, 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 it's a unique McCartney composition, but it's also. It's just him doing that thing he does where he goes, right, I'm just going to choose a new genre to do. Well, we'll see how we're doing it, I guess. And then he completely nails it. And it's like as good as Within You, Without You, or To You, or The Inner Light. I I am saying that's that, a, Ken. That's a stretch. I'm saying that. <laughs> look, okay. look, look, Ken, we had that revolver box set re- with, within the year. And on the uh, 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 one of the practice sessions for... It was like either Love You Too. Okay, I think it was. It was Love You Too. Paul is on the sitar. He can do this stuff. It's not It's not totally within the, the realms of impossibility for me that Paul's spontaneous offhand attempt at doing Indian music is as good as Harrison's sat down, I'm going to purposely do this. When, I think when you, Paul's that good. I do. I really when do. you think about all the work that was poured into Within You Without You, Come on. <laughs> I mean, look, look, I love writing into Jaipur. Don't get me wrong. And the, Paul musically is all over the place. He's the most, probably most eclectic artist we've ever had on the planet. I love the fact that he can play the sitar. Just brought up uh, tragedy. Mm. Plays the sitar on tragedy. <laughs> you know, that cover uh, during the Red Rose Speedway sessions. And uh, yeah, but I, I, yeah, you want to say I, something? Just, uh, yeah. <clears throat> something uh, um well speaking about the emotional side of of the of the album well let's think about these two incredible tracks that are from a lover to a friend mm. and i do which you know uh, also in the in the production and the arrangement are incredible because if you look if you listen to from a lover to a friend which is a great ballad but it's a little bit different Mm. From Paul, from what Paul has done uh, in other cases, so there are all these old uh, timings within the song. Yeah, and there's only, I think, two piano parts are credited: Paul and and um, and Gabe Dixon. Right. There's a fantastic bass part by Paul. There's a um, twelve-string electric guitar or something, and drums. I don't think there's nothing more 
which when you listen to this kind of tracks, it, it sounds perfect. I mean, very deep. So there's a, there's, there's something very special mm. to this. I agree with, uh, with Sam. Uh, there's, it's not, it's not easy to, to put out all his emotions like Paul did in this, in this album. Not, not, not easy. Yeah, as a lot of people have said, it's kind of like, um, you know, talking about losing Linda and then having a new love, which he was saying there, Sam, and you read into the lyrics and you can certainly get that that feel overall. From a lover to a friend, what a hook in the chorus there. <laughs> Once it's in your head, it's stuck there. And I, I've always loved um, Lonely Road. What a great opening cut that is. You know, again, reminds me of Stranglehold <laughs> in a way. But uh, the buildup in Paul's vocals towards the end, singing those high notes and throaty vocals and everything. It's great. It's fantastic. You know, Let's just think about the um, psychology of this for a second. The only two albums where Paul puts himself out there emotionally, the critics savage it. So no wonder we get my baby, she comes down at night. Like that, 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 that's him going, this is what, this is what they want, clearly. Oh man, it's, it's such a shame. And another thing that holds Driving Rain back, it's a bad album for compilations. I really don't think there are many tracks you can take out of it that work on their own. It's one of those albums for me that works best as a whole. And only things like Lonely Road or the title track really work or like your way but the rest of it for me it works best when you put it on and then you just surrender yourself to the whole album i can't listen to uh, I, don't, I don't know rinse the raindrops on a random playlist with hmm. bit bop and big barn bed you know what i mean it doesn't quite i can hear um tiny bubble tiny bubble could work in a compilation that's another one that i really think you know Stephanie. very commercial sticks mm -hmm. in your head after a couple of listens so yeah all right so the two of ken, you are at this point though ken at this point paul shouldn't be writing earworms because they're not going to be on the radio long enough to work on anyone anymore it's 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 a real shift where it's like you, you know you could just let i don't know let them in be a kind of slow burner and it would just be on the radio you know wings over the world is on tour they'll play it and if you didn't like it at first maybe that third time when you're driving to Spokane or something, you just hear boom, 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 mm. and it finally clicks. You can't do that with a modern radio station anymore. It's such a shame. If you want to hear Paul on, on, on the radio, you'll have to listen to an awful hour of the Howard Stern show now or something. No, you have to listen to my radio show, Every Little Thing. <laughs> and somehow, <laughs> Sam, I'm going to get you to listen to that show. Because it's on this hand. It's a really good show. Ken's, Ken, <laughs> Ken's a great guy, yeah. <laughs> I haven't read Luca's book yet, but um, I heard his first one was very good too. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> you going to do the Give My Regards to Broad Street pose there? Is that why you're doing that? Like this? No, no, Ken, I have to do it. It helps me with the impression. Oh, okay. I'm not I'm not being stupid. But, you know, or, like, or a bit of that. A bit of that as well. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> So now, Luca, question. please, please tell me you've picked the same third one as me, please. That's, that's what everyone's wondering. Can you be exactly okay. in sync on all three albums? So what's your number one, Luca? Number one, I was, uh, it was uh, kind of uh, difficult. Uh, so in the end, I have decided to not include anything from the 70s because basically the 70s have been gone through kind of a general reassessment. I think. Hmm. So my number one is off the ground. Ooh, okay. It's off the ground because uh, you know uh, basically it's um, compared to flowers in the dirt most of the times because it came after because uh, well, it was the following uh, studio album after uh, flowers in the dirt as a pop album. Uh, it, it followed a similar pattern with the word tour and stuff uh i think it sold quite well i mean uh, it was not successful uh in the uk and not that much in the us 
but it was quite successful all over the world because it sold uh, nearly 4 million copies, which if we consider that was 1993. And uh, we think about uh, George Michael having uh, Listen Without Prejudice, Volume 1, at the end of 1990, and it sold 8 million copies. Hmm. That gives us a perspective that uh, Off the Ground was not a bad uh, album in terms of sales. But to me, and uh, the general feeling uh, doesn't seem to me very, very appreciated. And if you look at, uh, at the songs in the album, I'm not speaking about uh, the B-sides and stuff, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible collection. You cannot uh, assess badly an album that has got hope of deliverance, the lovers that never were to me, mm. uh, incredible song. Come on, people! Uh, I can I can name basically all the songs. I mean, the 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 only thing compared to to Flowers in the Dirt that um, probably it's uh, it's one of the reasons why this album is not uh, um, very well considered these days is that the production side is. Uh, it's less uh, brilliant, less uh, you know, uh, colored compared to Flowers and Dirt. Flowers and Dirt has got different producers, so in the end, uh, each track is very different from uh, the other one. Uh, off the ground has got a more of a live feel, band feel again. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, it's uh, the songwriting. It's uh, it, it's incredible. So it it's an album that deserves uh, to be very high in a in a in a list of McCartney album. To in my opinion. Okay, I'll share my thoughts in a few moments. But I want to get your take on that, Sam. Uh, well, off the ground was my go-to original choice but i thought uh i feel like it, it to me it's the most stereotypical i guess underrated mccartney album because it's just so obviously is like driving rain it's sandwiched between these two titans you got flowers and flaming on either side of it and it kind of gets lost in the middle mm. and you know because all Port luke will surely agree with this all beetle dialogue is all based around UK, US, UK, US. That's all the books ever care about. Mm. Why is it not championed that uh, number one album in Netherlands and Germany? Like, we just, we don't care about these countries because they're mm. not part of the dialogue. They're not part of the conversation. And yet it was so popular in those countries that they got a better version of the album. We can't underestimate that. That is so crucial as to why it works. And... Uh, it, it look let's let, let's just say Mendelssohn is another underrated McCartney producer. There's no mm. album that sounds like it. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of chances, and it does a lot of stuff that I wish Paul kind of kept carrying on doing, like a lot more of the kind of homely home based songs he was doing. Like he started that on Flowers in the Dirt, and he was doing it a lot more here, like um, uh, uh, Mistress and Maid, for example. Mm. Obviously, one of ones from the Flowers in the Dirt sessions, but that's a highlight of his of his whole career. Uh, Bike like an icon is not a bad song, just like how Driving Rain itself is not a bad song, or the other me is not a bad song. Um, yeah, again, it's it's all just perceptions with uh, off the ground, and I think people really kind of ignore how big it was and how big the tour was, and I think there's just a few vocal fans from say like the 93 or uh, the tour who were just a bit upset that they, they didn't like those songs that much and would rather have heard things we said today for the 50th time or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I couldn't agree with Luca more. I really couldn't. Yeah. I got to say, I mean, off the ground, I love every song on the album, but it's, it's of all of Paul's albums, and on the various different podcasts there are out there, especially on Two Legs, they go through this whole, what would you take off? And what would you put on? And what was a B-side at the time? And was that better than what was on the album? And 
But with Off the Ground, those bonus cuts on the CD singles, some of them are better than what was on the album. And I mean, it's it's right in your face. <laughs> I mean, long like, long, coat. come on. I mean, what I would give for Paul to do long leather coat in concert. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, I can't imagine keep coming back to love. You know, all these great songs that were, you know, just left as bonus tracks. You know, it could have easily have been like Red Rose Speedway, <laughs> a double album. But I, I, I think we 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 have to blame uh, the band for this because uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, they 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 did a, a poll. Uh, <laughs> so Paul decided to the band. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, having part on on uh, choosing the best songs being on the album, and so <laughs> it's not it's not Paul's fault this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Luca, is this is this like when uh, Paul went? So right, everyone, we'll go write a couple of songs over the weekend, and we'll come back, and we have written the best <laughs> one. Well, oh well, it turns out the one that I wrote is the best one, so we'll do that. Like I can see in that poll, like everyone's vote counts as one, but Paul's vote counts as ten. So if he votes yeah, for a song, <laughs> it probably gets on the album. See Who here, knows? Paul is criticised at times for. You know, not allowing other opinions from other people. He has to have things his way. But he lets EMI have Red Rose Speedway as a single album. They let Yoko have two double albums the year before? What? Well, you know, we had a conversation about this at the, at the Fest for Beatles oh, fans. But I think that, you know, the expectations of Yoko Ono selling a lot of records is very low. You know, it wasn't that big a chance for Apple to put out a double album with approximately... It's because they weren't going to print a lot of those Yoko records, you reckon? And if it was Paul, you'd have to print, you know, so many. A few yeah. million, probably. Yeah. So that's probably why that was. Um, is that is that quote about, like, uh, there's a warehouse of back-to-the-egg boxes? Is that a real quote, or is that something someone made up? I don't know. Yeah, there was, a, there was something interesting that Paul said uh, at the time, because... Uh, I think I have to exclude this quote from my book because of uh, space. But at the time, he, he, he says something like, uh, well, it, it sold quite well. The fact is that they printed uh, w way more in excess. So he was, he was, uh, he was thinking about uh, something like print on demand at the time, which is quite interesting if we think that Paul uh, is not a genius, or, or it's a genius thing. only in in uh, in songwriting. No, it's a genius only. Also in in thinking about marketing stuff and and production and and everything that is connected to 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 the music world and not only music. <laughs> I mean, mm. well, <laughs> well, yeah, like uh, Paul was one of the first people to stop uh, scalpers and fake merch sellers on the uh, wing, wing, uh, Wings Over America tour as well. I know he's trying to crack. I'll move on to my third is that one true? before I start right. a di digression. We've Can been, I guess what it is? Can I guess what it um, is? Ken, you have one guess. I know you have a soft spot for Pipes of Peace. Yeah, it's Pipes of Peace. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it's nothing to do with this album necessarily being underrated, but it's got a twin. It's got a twin called Tug of War that might be the most overrated Paul McCartney album in the entire collection. Oh, it's the return to form. It's the, oh, it's the Paul that we've missed. He never went anywhere, you dolts. You just weren't paying enough attention. To me, Tug of War is Paul trying too hard, placating to the crowd and relying too much on the fact that George Martin's there for clout. There's not much of a, a vibe on Tug of War. It's, it, I feel it's, it's quite a soulless collection of very good to above average songs but on parts of peace apologies for using a very young word here but it's all about the vibes it's just a nice vibe you put the album on and you can either listen to it intently and listen to all of paul's underrated bass work on that album or the wonderful mm. production uh or the very underrated harmony vocals as well or you can just kind of put it on in the background and it can be like uh, Holidays or the Russian album or um, Run Devil Run, where it can be quite fun background music as well. You, mm -hmm. you, you, you can, you know, you can listen to it 
in any kind of mode. And I think a lot of that is because it, it's it's quite just a fun and relaxed, you know, vo- again, vibe, I hate to use that word, uh, atmosphere to, to, to the whole thing. It reminds me a lot of, like, Wildlife, Makai 2, any of those rock and roll cover albums. And most of the time, if the artist is having fun, or the actor, or the writer, yada, yada, then the audience tends to not have fun. But this is a case where you just feel like you're in a bit of a party atmosphere. Like the whole album feel, feel, feels like Mrs. Vanderbilt or something where you're just like, yeah, we're having fun. This is Paul. <laughs> nice time. There's uh, a wide variety of genres on this album. The average McCartney record, you got rock, pop, uh, cheesy love songs, proper ballads, a jam instrumental, an experimental mashup. Um, you get another album here that is purposefully very 80s like going back to like hey hey and stuff like that that you you know that to me just screams heart fm here in the uk like our our big 80s uh station and every everything just works for me it's it's all very subtle there's nothing that really uh jumps out at you as like being the greatest thing ever but there is a consistency for me that is above average on a Paul McCartney record. There are no real low points for me. And there are no, I mean, people might say, 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 or through our love or the title track are real high points, but I put kind of everything. I just kind of a solid eight. Everything's just above okay. average. And, and I find that to be really intriguing. It's Paul having a lot of fun, a lot of different sounds. And I think that is because, well, you know, we put all the good stuff on tug of war. So, Let's just have a bit of a party. And that's what you get with, with Pipes of Peace. And because everyone's so... Co- and people are so enamoured with Here Today that I think it clouds Pipes of Peace. It's just that one song on, on Tug of War that instantly makes it better for, for everyone. Um, and I'm just going to say it now. <laughs> the man is better than what's that you're doing in terms of what would a song between these two artists sound like how good would it be and what's that you're doing is the most disappointing Stevie Wonder song ever and the man is just okay so that alone <laughs> <laughs> boosts it up for me um yeah well just you know what it's just me being defiant to the tug of war fandom I'm not, you know big farmer uh and then there's big tug of war as well <laughs> Well, as I've said, I welcome different opinions here on this show, <laughs> whether I agree with them or not. You know, I love Pipes of Peace, a lot of Pipes of Peace, although yeah. I think that um, you know, Average Person, which is one song that I used to say is, was one of my least favorites of all of Paul's, it gets stuck in my head, that chorus, so I must like it to some mm. degree, but it really is overblown, that song. It's a little bit too hokey for me at times um and i love i love the collaborations between stevie wonder and michael jackson on both tug of war and and pipes of peace without comparing them really i do think a missed opportunity i'm sorry the the man should have been a single yeah you can't no but they're they're two they're two giants they're they're tremendous talents and paul sounds great with both of them ebony and ivory which gets so much logistically it's it's paul seeking a slight air of commercialism with whichever of the biggest African-American artists there are at the time. I just uh, He was always a big Stevie Wonder fan to begin with. You know, he always supported Stevie Wonder and he had a relationship with Michael Jackson going back, you know, for writing Girlfriend, which yeah. really was written for him in mind. So he had that in the back of his head anyway. Um, and Michael Jackson approached Paul, remember? He said, let's make some hits. Paul didn't approach him, you know, so it's just a matter of admiration at the same time, liking these people. And they did sound good together, which is the bottom line. And what's that you're doing may not be the greatest composition, but for someone who just talked about Pipes of Peace has that party atmosphere. Well, what's that you're doing is like, you know, it's a jam between the two of them having a lot of fun. And, you know. I do like that all is the my songs. Point. They're having fun. I'm not having fun. That, okay. that fits into my point perfectly. I do like all the songs on Pipes of Peace. And I do think Through Our Love is one of Paul's greatest love songs, which doesn't get... Arguably, yeah. You know, 
You know, yeah. I really wish that was a single over so bad, but I know a lot of people love I so feel bad. about Through Our Love the way most people feel about Warm and Beautiful. Okay. L yeah. Yeah. Mm. Underrated, lost, classic ballad. I, I, I am, prefer it to... Yeah. I am partial to, to Pipes of Peace because it was my introduction to Paul's music. So I got a really soft spot. So I cannot consider... This album I, I underrated, but I see your point. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it's it's an album with a, a, a number one in UK and number one in uh, in the US. First two songs are <laughs> we start like <laughs> like that, <laughs> and then there's a you know a, let me call it a, maybe it's not experimental, but if you look at side two, the Swiss little show, there's hey hey, there's tug of peace, so songs that are a little bit different, not that melodic. Uh, so it, it's a nice atmosphere, I, I, I agree. And uh, I remember at the time, uh, the man had, had got uh, got uh, quite a good airplay, even in Italy. Mm. So I was really convinced that it was a single and it was canceled at the last minute. So I think that uh, radio stations were aware that the new single was to be the man and it would have been a hit i'm sure see we were talking oh, earlier about that the second single's not doing well i mean so bad i like the song but that was not the right choice as a second single to me anyway um i would have much rather the man was the second single or even through our love over so bad so do you reckon that's just paul going i don't want the the second single to be the, another collaboration I can I can see him purely just on that aesthetic alone. I don't want two big successful singles in a row with the help of someone else. You know, like when he was, um, I don't want to release a greatest hits album because that shows that your, your career's over. I could see that kind of visual thing being apparent in Paul's mind. I suppose it's possible, but I've maintained that when it comes to these duets, the biggest reason why they're successful is because the two people work so well together. When I listen to Ebby and Ivory solo without Stevie Wonder, it ain't happening for me. Ugh, yeah. Stevie Wonder makes a huge difference in that song, not just because he's the great Stevie Wonder, but they sound great together vocally. You know, we, we, we just need AI to do the Stevie Wonder no, solo version don't, now. <laughs> don't even mention. Don't even talk about AI with me. <laughs> so, Ken, you said you like unique opinions, and I am going to be the podcaster to spearhead this. I am going to be. I, 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 I love this phase, and I love how much it upsets you. <laughs> well, you may not see Sam on this channel for a while, I think. But uh... <laughs> oh. AI is also my favorite Steven Spielberg movie. No, it's not. It's no one's favorite Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a separate show and just talk about AI with various people. Anyway, Ken, I want to do that on my show, so you might be the first guest for that. Okay. Oh, by the way, I think we're going to do it. A tug of war album, Soulless. I mean, uh, the song "Tug of War" is a okay, gorgeous song, and a I was great... being a... comparatively, so, comparatively okay. soulless. All right. You know, and you talk about pipes in the way that Paul or... McCartney song can be comparatively bad to another Paul McCartney song. You know, you know, when it comes to Tug of War and Pipes of Peace, I love both those albums. I think Tug of War is a stronger album, but the only thing that's lacking to me on both those albums are rockers. And I love, mm -hmm. love, love, love ballroom dancing to death. That's like the most up tempo, you know, really strong, powerful, great vocals from Paul. You know, anything that's close to a rocker on on tug of war and um you got keep undercover i guess on pipes of peace but that's that's not a heavy rocker it's piano led again isn't it yeah he... okay but anyway yeah. so this has been great having the two of you on sharing your opinions you know i'm not going to go through all my reasons for what for my top three but for, for me number three is back to the egg number two is driving rain and number one is press to play so you know it's great that all all three of us picked press to play and driving rain there yeah. great minds think alike i guess it's the correct answer <laughs> Ken. it's the correct answer 
Although so I'd say Back to the Egg is a slightly overrated, but I'll, I I won't elaborate further. Okay. We'll have to do a show on that, I suppose. Luca's book right here, Music is Ideas. Make sure you pick it up. A tremendous reference book. Everything you wanted to know about Paul in the first two decades of his solo career, about each individual song. I love it for so many reasons. Find out who plays on every single track. Find out all the recording dates for every song when it moved to different studios. There's so much that's packed into this book, including unreleased McCartney songs as well. So um, still Thank hoping you, for Water Spout to come out, you know. And hey, you know, <laughs> if you can't get access to Luca's new book, I'm sure you can also buy copies of his first book as well. That's true. Which also, I got Luca to the left of me, Luca to the right of me right here <laughs> and below Luca in front of me luca is everywhere luca thanks for joining us again we'll have well, you on you. soon like i said to talk about paul in the 80s and sam continued success with paul or nothing and uh hopefully i'll be on your show very soon Awesome. Um, it's still going to be a while till we get up to Chaos and Creation, but I think we need a classic Sam and Ken don't talk about an album episode soon. <laughs> you go track by you do three hour shows, man. I don't know how you do it. Multiple. Well, no, Ken. So with Driving Rain, I did an episode with you, and then I did an episode with one of the lads over on the Untitled Beatles podcast as, as well. So yeah, I think for Chaos and Creation, I need to do a third three hour podcast. <laughs> Didn't we do three shows on Off the Ground? Yeah. I think so. We did a show. We did a show just on the bonus tracks. Yeah. Oh god. God. Oh my god. Yeah. That was... No, I think it was three recording sessions, but two episodes. Okay. That Whatever. Look, Luke has got to go, Ken. We've got to yes. wrap this up. Okay. Come all on. right. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining me. Thanks to all of you for watching. You. If you haven't subscribed, please do so already. And in Paul tradition. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.